Um, now, my memory is that we were last talking, we were just starting electron positron scattering. Okay. Actually, you have a question. Yes. On the last thing about that, the first question was um, about why the first order doesn't contribute. Yes. And is there like a, I, I couldn't see like a mathematical, is, is it simple? Yes. Well, yeah. All right. So let, let's let's discuss that. Um, but it's, is it the same logic as the third order? The what was the process? Tell me what the process was. I think it's just electron electron. Electron electron scattering. Okay. So what we have is um, with electron electron scattering. This is the diagram, and um, there are actually two diagrams. That's one. And the other one the other one is this. And in particular we have P prime leaving out the spin, we have P prime, Q prime, PQ. Okay, so the the Implicitly, I didn't say this explicitly, but we're assuming that P and P prime and Q prime are different from P and Q. So the term P prime, Q prime, one plus integral E psi bar A slash psi E fourth X PQ. Well, this term doesn't contribute because the initial final states are very different. Yeah. Okay. Somewhat different. Now, this one doesn't contribute also because, and now there are many different ways of saying this, but one, is, the simplest is that the electromagnetic uh, annihilation creation operators, the annihilation operator can't contribute because there are no photons here. So K of K and lambda on PQ is just zero. This acts on a photon mode. The photon mode is zero. That applies to all no photons in the initial state. But there's never any photons in the initial state, so... In this process. But like there are in compound scattering. The reason order compound... Order. What? Does that not apply to second order and third order? I mean, second order and fourth order. Yes, yes, it does. But in second order, what happens is there's a photon created here and absorbed there because we're two A's. Yeah. So it's A couples with A dagger. And so the first one is an A dagger acting on the vacuum. And then an A over here that catches the photon before it destroys the final state. In a sense. So, and then of course the A dagger, okay. Um, so this is in the definition. Of and, and, and then there's another reason why it's, it's zero. Because you see, you only have two fields here. So you could annihilate an electron and create an electron, and that could take, that could make P prime, turn P prime, P into P prime, but still you'd have Q and Q prime different. So you need at least second order, a uh, third, the, the, if this is the zeroth order and this is the first order, you need the second order term. So you can't, can you not have any odd orders? Couldn't you just create? I think you're right. I think you're right that there are no odd orders in this process, yes. Could you make like something that goes from the middle, like the kind of middle up into the middle? Something that something yeah. where? So I don't I'm just but like in the, so if you take that diagram in the middle and it goes up to say P prime, some sort of interaction there. Where so, so that would be higher order. Would, would that be a third order term? Oh no, I think it would have to be fourth order. Um, I mean, it, it, whenever you make the diagram more complicated, what you do is you add something like this. And what this represents, this picture represents, the wavy is the A and the, and the straights are these two guys. And of course, they're always like that. So you can rotate the thing. So is 
how many vertices you have the order of the right. So it must be even. Yeah. So is that right? Am I right that we were starting positron and uh, electron positron scattering? Yes. Okay. So. Now electron positron scattering is sort of a big deal because um, the there was a whole ex there was an accelerator created at SLAC that did electron positron scattering, and then another one created at uh, in Geneva, and I don't know the order of it. It might have been that it was first in Geneva, but I don't think so. I think it was first at SLAC, then they built one in Geneva at CERN, then I think they built a bigger one at SLAC, and then a much bigger one at CERN. Then they destroyed the one at CERN, which was called Let Lodge Electron Positron Machine. They turned, they, they kept the tunnel but got rid of all the equipment and put in bigger magnets to make the LHC, which was the Lodge, is the Lodge Hadron Collider. And um, so, as I said, there are um, two processes for um, electron-positron scattering. One is um, simply this. But there's another one in which that, that, that's more interesting. And it's this. And the reason why I say this is more interesting is that you can imagine what happens if in electron-positron scattering, instead of having electrons and positrons colliding at ordinary energies, say a few MeV, you have them colliding at very high energies. Then you create this virtual photon, and then any term in the action density that uh, would correspond, for example, to a muon field, the electromagnetic field, a muon field, or a quark field, the electromagnetic field, another quark field, all the charged particles potentially can contribute here. And so what they did at SLAC and at CERN was they cranked up the energy and they were producing all sorts of things in the final state. And the great beauty of these machines is they knew what the initial state was because quantum electronics is a very good <coughs> theory. And so they knew what the initial state was and then they could say, well, to the lowest order, what they're making in the final state is simply uh, a pair of muon, anti-muon, quark, anti-quark, or whatever. And then, then of course, when they made quarks, the um, mystery came as to why they didn't see the quarks in the final state. Instead, what they would see in the final state was basically two jets with um, uh, in other words, hadrons coming out in these two directions. So, um, yeah. So you hear about uh, quantum electrodynamics being able to predict the charge on the electron to something like eleven decimal places. Have you? Did you think? I, I, I don't. Okay. Think no, I, I would say that it's been measured very precisely okay. the charge of the electron, but um, that's not a prediction. That's a fundamental constant that you know be nice to predict. You know, maybe in your lifetime. But that, but certainly not in mine. Is that a question? Yeah, I do. Um, oh, okay. you, this, on the second diagram, you've drawn, do you draw, I mean, it's kind of, I know it's kind of relevant, but the, you've drawn a favor of like horizontal. Yes. What's the reason for that? Well, it's, it's let, let, let's just go to the thing we're talking about. Namely, let's assume now that we're actually talking about electron positron scattering. So this is the moment, full momentum of the electron, and that's of the positron. Then the term is going to be e squared over 2 integral psi bar a slash psi psi bar a slash psi d fourth x d fourth y. 
And um, so this is, let us say, at x, and this is at y. So this point can be x, or that, and that point y, it can be any y. In time, does y not have to occur after x? No. Um, let's put it this way. I mean, you know, don't don't make me get super serious about this, but I think that if you analyze this in detail, put in wave functions or something, you'd see that although y doesn't have to account occur before x, and it certainly doesn't in the integral, you'd find that the the probability of this process, the contribution of y before x would be small, unless uh, uh, unless y. It's basically that when you depart from the classical process by more than a few h bar, things fall off. That's generally true. Okay, so. What you've got here is a photon propagator, and so for practical purposes, the, the, in fact, in time, for practical purposes, y and x are coincident in time. In other words, they're probably within, an, certainly within a microsecond, and possibly within a nanosecond. I mean, for, 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 in other words, probably not being that is Zippo, let's say, I think. All right, so what is this then? It's uh, P prime, S prime, Q prime, T prime. Remember that there's a factor of two here, but we decide that something's going to happen at X. And so we'll say this happens at X, or this happens at X. And then we get rid of the two. And so we have e squared integral time ordered product. And now in this, I'm going to do this diagram first. And so we have psi bar plus y a slash uh, psi of y minus, and then psi bar at x minus a slash side of x plus psqt and of course d fourth x d fourth y. Now, why did I do things like this? This is a plus because I'm doing, I'm, I'm annihilating the electron at x and then annihilating the positron I'm sorry, creating, uh, this is the second diagram, I'm doing this diagram, <coughs> creating the electron, the final electron at x. And so that means we have psi minus, at psi bar minus at x. Remember, psi of x is an integral yeah. e to b over by 3 halves u of P and S, B of P and S, E to the I P X plus B of P and S, C data of P and S, E to the minus I P X, and then psi bar is same thing, but you have U bar, B data, P minus I P X plus V bar C E to the I P X. So those are what the fields, that's what the field looks like. And so um, you want to annihilate the incoming electron and create the final electron at X. So that means you use B, use the annihilating part of psi and the creating part of psi minus. And then over here, you're doing the same thing, but with positrons. But with positrons, 
the annihilating part is the annihilating part, the thing that annihilates the positron is the annihilating part of psi bar. So you have psi bar annihilating, psi creating. And so this would be here. And so this thing creates the electron. I'm sorry. It's, I've got it. Well, sorry, let's do it right. This, is, this annihilates the incoming positron at y, and this creates the outgoing positron. There's the creation operator for the outgoing positron. Okay. So that's the picture. And now, once you've written this down, it's just mechanics to get it right. You just have to quote the earlier things. Um, this e squared, there's this 2 pi to the 3 halves, and um, if we first do the electrons, then there are two of them here. So this is 2 pi cubed. And then we have q prime, t prime, integral, time ordered product, psi bar plus y, a slash of y, psi minus of y. And now what's left here is u bar of p prime, s prime, a slash of x, u of, of p and s, and then the phase factors, e to the i, p minus p prime x, d fourth x, d fourth y. And then the, the initial positron, t. And then when you act with these operators, what you have is e squared over 2 pi to the sixth. And now you just have the vacuum time ordered product, and, well, let's see, you've got this thing here, what's that? That's the, an the annihilating part of psi bar, so that's a v-bar. So we've got a v-bar, and um, qt, that's the initial positron. So, as I've said to you before, the, the antiparticles the spinners to the antiparticles are really screwy, and I almost wonder whether it might be better to change the notation, uh, but I guess it's not better. I mean, if it were better to change the notation, Feynman would have changed it. Um, he certainly knew how to do things like that. Well, he knew how to do everything. Um, and then the final positron is left over from this field. And now we've got u bar p prime s prime a slash of x u p s vacuum. And now from the fields of y, we have e to the i q minus q prime y plus i p minus p prime x d fourth x, d fourth y. So that's what's left. And now everything in here is a number except for the photon operator here and the photon operator there. It's, they're time ordered and they're sitting in a vacuum. So that's just the photon propagator. We have a formula for that. So at this point, the, what we might say amplitude we might put it like this, amplitude, that amplitude is then, oh, there's a minus sign. What's the minus sign? The minus sign is that in this step, going from here to here, the creation operator acts on the final state, the annihilation operator on the initial state, so they have to cross. That crossing produces a minus sign because they anti-commute. I ought to, when I teach this, whenever I teach, I should wear a sling that holds my left arm <laughs> up. Um, all right, so we've got minus e squared over 2 pi to the sixth integral v bar qt 
gamma b b of q prime t prime uh, all right I'll, q minus q prime y q bar of p prime s prime gamma a u of p and s e to the i p minus p prime x and now vacuum time order product it's a b of y a a of x vacuum p fourth x p fourth y formula for that, and the formula, I'll use up this board, it's the vacuum time ordered product, let us say, well let's just see what it was, a b of y, a a of x, is, um, minus i integral a to a b e to the i k y minus x d fourth k over two pi to the fourth k squared minus i epsilon. So that's the photon propagator. And this, remember, this is what came from our path integral treatment of these things. On the other hand, when we do Compton scattering, we have, have we done Compton scattering already? Yeah, we started it last time. We started it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, am I redoing yeah. Yeah, electron we did bus a lot of this. Yeah. Oh, I already did? I finished electron bus time? Yes. Well, I. Oh gosh. So I actually completely finished electron bus run? All right, well let's say, I hope this was a useful review. Um, and it, it does at least point out something, namely that for processes where you have an internal line, then you use this form for the propagator which came from uh, the pattern of the formulation. On the other hand, for processes like Compton scattering, where you have final and initial and final state photons, then you use the Coulomb gauge expression for the photon field. All right, so I think what I'll do is Almost no want to. The reason why I did this is, by the way, is that I added a lot. I, what I did was I extended the, the, the electron positron to electron positron goes to mu plus mu minus. <coughs> so I think maybe I ought to pretend that that's what I'm doing. Um, so in other words, in this case, there is no, this diagram doesn't exist. We only have this, and now the potential V is E psi bar A slash psi for electrons plus E psi bar A slash psi for muons. And now, if we're doing this process, everything is the same going down to 
this state, but now at y, we're creating everything. And here at x, we're annihilating everything. And so, um, so there's no uh, e mu term in the potential? Or well, I'm just asking why is there no e mu term in the potential? Why is there e and only mu mu, but not e mu? Well, because the muon is, as far as we know, the muon has the same properties as the electron. The same interaction with the electromagnetic field as the electron. It just weighs 210 times more. Mm. So the mass here is like 105.7, I think, MeV. This is 0.51 or so MeV. But the same charge here. We could also put a tau here. And in fact, we could also add terms with quarks. So the, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we could add. So when you're trying to do that, like actually do calculations, do you just ignore the other terms and, and the adding quark terms and stuff in, and just say that we're only interested in this V? Like, I, I guess I'm kind of confused. Like, yeah, well, well, yeah, I mean, you, you know, you do things practically and there's no point putting down all sorts of stuff that isn't going to matter in the calculation. So let's suppose we wanted to calculate now the amplitude for electron positron goes to mu plus mu minus. All right, so that's this thing. I guess so. When you say amplitude, you mean the probability of it happening. Well, is it first we compute? No, first we well, it's the probability amplitude. Okay. And then we have to take the absolute value square of that, and then we multiply by final state density, you know, and so forth. We do the Fermi Golden Rule thing. And. I think I'm, I'm going to defer that till next semester, um, but it's 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 not any different from what you saw in quantum mechanics, time-dependent perturbation theory. So I guess you just you do these calculations like after you know what happens, like if you're trying to do. Like, I, I guess I'm kind of like. So you, you just pick a V and say, like, we're Here, interested. let me throw you a chocolate first. Um, so I, I guess I'm confused. Like, right now we're just doing theoretical calculations. If V was this, and we're interested in these terms, um, that this is what we get. And then so then you go and figure out what the probability is based off of other things. And then so that would kind of give you some, I guess I don't necessarily see where we're headed with this. You want to compute the amplitude for e plus e minus goes to mu plus mu minus. And we know that this is the hard part of the electron interaction. This is the hard part of the muon interaction, because they're the same, except for mass. But of course, the muon also has an h0 term, which again is the same as the electron one, just a different mass. Is that a question? Uh, yeah, if I don't need a chocolate. Um, so to normalize your eventual probability, could you need to include all the terms, like all the things that the electron positron could have all the final states? Well, if, if, we're just going from, if we're just going from muons, in other words, if, I mean, the experimentalists know when they detect a muon or when they detect an electron. And we're computing then the probability, eventually the probability for e plus e minus goes to mu plus mu minus. So we just look at this amplitude, where this is mu plus mu minus. And so then the field here is the mu on here and the electrons there. And so now, um, what do we have? Um,
So, as I said, the, the, this one is right for annihilating the electron, but now we're, not, we're using the annihilating part of this, and what we get is a, um, a V bar. So this is V bar, and it's not P prime S prime, it's, it's the initial one, QT. So this is V bar, QT, and if you want, uh, and these are both electron ones, so we can put electrons there. So that's at X. Now at Y, what we're doing is we're creating the both of them there. And um, so in particular, this one, psi minus, the creation part here, is going to create the positron. So we're going to get a V. Q prime, T prime, that's right. But now we have psi bar minus is going to create a muon, and that one is here, and so that's going to be a U bar. U bar, uh, and it would be, uh, let us say, if that's Q prime, T prime, then this one is P prime, S prime. And these are both muon spinners. So I call them muon spinners because the muon spinners are different from the electron spinners because the spinners have the masses in them. Okay. So, could you explain why you erased that diagram from earlier? Um, the one that. The upper one? Yeah, why doesn't that exist? Oh, anymore? well, because that upper one is the process E plus E minus goes, that just gives you the electrons in the final state. Oh, I see. Oh no, it's, it was it would give you an electron and a positron in the final state. Hmm. Okay, and then this is now that happens if you have when you have the the accelerator with colliding beams, electron positron, the final state is electron and positron scattered, but it's also muons and, and muon scattered, scattered muons. Okay. So, if I edit this thing so that so that it's the this will be U bar P prime S prime. V of Q prime, T prime, V bar of QT, and U of PS. And these are electrons, and these are muon spinners. And um, we're creating both at Y, so it looks like this. And we're annihilating both here, so it looks like that. And this time I decided to get religion and use alphabetical order. And um, so it is um, a a. So now using this formula for this mean value in the vacuum of the time order product, what we get is all right, hold it now. In this particular process, notice the uh, annihilation operators went forward and the creation operators went backward. So there's no extra um, 
There's no extra minus sign, at least if the, um, if the ordering makes sense. So let me make sure about the ordering. Um, the way we agreed to write this was that this was B dagger, C dagger on the vacuum because we took part. Uh, you see, this, this is a convention, and it, it doesn't matter as long as you don't change the convention during a calculation. So if we say that this is the order, is this the order that we can only use? Yeah, so. I get to be. All right. Then there's no, um, this is the uh, positron, the electron annihilation operator couples with this, and the positron annihilation operator with that, and so there's no minus sign there. What do we have here? Here we have vacuum, and it's basically the same state again, but when we take the adjoint, we get CB. And now, um, yeah, this one, is, this one is the creation part of psi bar. The creation operator psi bar is for electrons. And so indeed, that's the B dagger couples with the B, and then the C dagger will couple with the C. So there's no extra minus sign there. So this minus sign is really a plus sign. But the time order product gives you a minus i. So now we have a minus i e squared over, um, and now it's 2 pi to the 10. And now um, integral u bar mu t prime s prime gamma a b mu 2 prime t prime e to the minus i 2 plus 2 prime y v bar e q t gamma b u e p s e to the i p plus p prime x and now we have um, Um, times a to a b over k squared minus i epsilon e to the i k y minus x t4 k and the two pi to the fourth I already put over there and um, so we have d fourth x d fourth y okay so now these things provide us with very nice delta functions the, um, the, the d fourth x gives us, and, and with the d fourth x divided by 2 pi to the fourth, so this is then minus i e squared over 2 pi squared integral u bar mu p prime s prime gamma a b mu q prime t prime. And then V bar E Q T gamma B U E P S. Uh, the A to A B is simple. This just lowers the B to an A. There's going to be a K squared minus I epsilon. This is a D fourth K. And now the delta functions. We're going to have a delta fourth. The x gives us what? P plus P prime uh, minus K. And the other one gives us the y's uh, uh, K minus Q minus Q prime. And so we integrate over d fourth k, that just tells us k is p plus p prime. So down here, this becomes just p plus p prime squared. If you want, you can put the minus i epsilon in there, but it doesn't make any difference. And now this k is p plus p prime, so this delta function is an overall energy momentum delta function and um, it's p prime plus q prime minus p minus q. 
So this ensures conservation of four momentum. We've done the d4k integration. There's no more integral sign. So this is the final answer for the amplitude. Um, and this is this is equation thirty-eight in the in the notes. Now um, to proceed from here, we have to take the absolute value squared, and then um, we do some more. Um, manipulation. So let, let me show you a little bit of how that goes. The absolute value square p prime s prime q prime t prime p s q t would then be e to the fourth over two pi to the fourth, and then this thing, u bar p prime s prime gamma a v sub mu, and this mu just means muon, it's not a four vector index. that part, and then there's a kinematic part, which is the delta fourth of p prime plus q prime minus p minus q, and then delta fourth of zero, because this thing is squared. And this argument, therefore, has to be zero, so it's zero in this one because this is one in forces. And then what we have is p plus q squared squared. Okay? All right, now what is, now we have to figure out what some of these things are. But over there you had q plus p prime squared on the, on the denominator. Right. But we're squaring everything. So it's p plus q to the fourth. But why, why did you go from p prime to q? We're squaring the amplitude to get the probability. This is the probability. But why did the p prime turn into a q? Duh. It's because I made a mistake when I wrote this down. Okay. This is P plus Q. And yeah, it, it's certainly P plus Q in the notes. Well, let's see, where was this thing? I unfortunately erased the delta functions, but um, Ah, 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 ah. There was, all right. I did not fix these phase factors. Very good uh, observation. The incoming particles are P and Q, and they're annihilated at X. And the final ones going out are P prime plus Q prime. So that's what it is. It's, okay, that was, that's a great, question. Okay, so now let's redo these delta functions. The delta function for x is p plus q minus k, and the delta function for y is um, k minus p prime minus q prime. So now you see k has to be p plus q. So this k becomes p plus q squared. 
and uh, what's left over then is k is p plus q, and so the one that's left over is p plus q minus p prime minus q prime. Of course, the delta function is even, so it doesn't matter uh, which way you do it. Um, so that's that's right. You, 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 you're entitled to two. You want two? No. I'm good. That's someone else wants it. Is anybody starving? It's Christmas time. All right. So let me show you some of the what are called gamma gymnastics here that you, you have to deal with. So let's look at the U-bar gamma AV term. This is, this is a number. And this is another number. And we're taking the absolute value of this number squared times the absolute value of that number squared. So let's just look at this part. Well, it's certainly u bar gamma AV. And then it's, um, it's u bar gamma AV complex conjugate. Okay. So that's u bar gamma AV. And then that's V dagger, gamma A dagger. And now remember, U bar is really U dagger I gamma zero. By the way, this I gamma zero is what's called beta, and it is just zero, one, one, zero. So it basically takes, it interchanges the upper and the lower components of the four component Dirac spinner. Okay, so we have V dagger. So we have the, the adjoint of this, gamma A dagger. We have a minus I, gamma zero dagger, U. Okay, now, um, gamma zero is minus I zero one one zero. So it is anti-hermitian. It's imaginary and symmetric. This is gamma alpha zero. So gamma zero dagger is minus gamma zero. On the other hand, gamma vector is minus I zero sigma minus sigma zero. So this is hermitian. So let's do the zero case first. We get a minus sign, a minus sign, that's two minus signs. And so this thing is equal to uh, an overall. I, I mean, you basically have to work this out for yourself. Um, a minus sign, a minus sign, they cancel. You just have a minus i. You bring the i forward, and then this is v bar gamma 0. So gamma a is turned into gamma 0 because a was 0. So it's just an overall minus sign. Now if it's vector, uh, if it's vector, we get no minus sign. But when we pull the gamma zero through, we get another minus sign because gamma zero and gamma vector anti-commute. So altogether, this is minus u bar gamma a v v bar gamma a u. So that's this first term. The second term is v bar gamma lower a u absolute value squared and um, so this is going to do basically the same thing it's going to be minus v bar gamma a u u bar gamma a v so you can just, it, because of the muon and electrons, you can just ignore kind of the cross terms? There aren't any cross terms. This is, I haven't ignored anything. These are all mu's. What about saying the, the mu times 
times the electron generator. Where? Shouldn't there be, when you, when you take the absolute value of that squared? The, it, let, let, let's think about it. This is a four component spinner. This is a four by four matrix. This is a four component spinner. You do the matrix product, it's a number. Over here, another number. The first number is a complex number. You take the absolute value squared, you get this. And the second one, you take the absolute value squared of this, where these are electrons, and you get that. All right. Now, we okay there? Now, I want to show you something now that's a little bit, it's, First time you see it, you must think this is magic, but um, it's not. Um, all right, let's. I, I ought to follow my notes so I don't make any mistakes here. So let's consider this thing. What is it? It's minus. U bar, I'm going to su su suppress the mu's. It's U bar B, gamma A B C, V C, and then there's a V bar, and what do I call it? D, gamma A D E, U E. Okay? All right, now, let me just see what I did here. Okay, um, what I did is I took these terms this as minus VC V bar D gamma A D E U E U bar B gamma A B C and so I haven't really changed anything right we're summing over B C D and E but now I've written it in such a way that it looks like a trace. And so in other words, if you think of this as a matrix product of this, if you now, instead of writing this as, you think of this as a, a matrix element, a CD matrix element, a DE, an EB, and a BC, well, this thing is minus trace of V, V bar, gamma A, U, U bar. All right? So it's, you see, it's a little bit tricky because, in fact, it confused me, and I've been doing this for 50 years. Um, hate to mention it, to admit that, but anyway. Um, so, the, the key thing is that when you get this, instead of thinking of this as the, just a component of a, of a four spinner, component, uh, component of a spinner, another component of a spinner, you think of a product as a CD element of a matrix, and it's the matrix that's the outer product of these two spinners. In fact, one of the things that Dirac did was to introduce the idea of outer products or, or introduce a notation that made it easier to write outer products. In other words, uh, he also had a, a, used a better notation for inner products, but the old notation for inner products was okay. The old notation was basically like that. What Dirac said, well, we can also have an outer product. 
like that. And that then is a, is a matrix or an operator. And uh, okay, so we have this. Of course, is a V. So, and that's a U. But now remember what these things are. Remember we. Oh, first of all, if one had a, a gazillion dollars and could do these experiments in such a way that you had polarized beams of electrons and positrons and you had super detectors that were measuring the polarization of the outgoing muons, then you'd stick with this and you wouldn't sum all the spins. But in reality, almost all experiments are done with unpolarized initial states and the detectors don't detect the polarization of the final states. And so what you do then is you average over the initial spins and you sum over the final spins. So when you average, you sum over the initial spins also, but divide by the number of initial spins. And so the sum over the final spins, these were the final state particles. So we're summing over them. If we sum over them, we then sum over uh, S prime and T prime. But remember, um, back when we talked about Dirac spinners, I s had you do as a homework problem, I think, compute that V, prime, v of Q prime T prime V bar of Q prime T prime <coughs> summed over, actually summed over T prime in this case. What is it? Well, it's 1 over 2 Q prime 0 minus I Q prime slash minus M. And so that's what we use here. And then we're signing also over S prime. So maybe I should use this back forward. What do you say? For some reason, this. The coldness has gotten rid of all the allergens in the air, so there's no more sneezing. Okay, so you have the sum over S prime of U of P prime S prime, U bar of P prime S prime, and this is 1 over 2 P prime 0 minus I P prime slash plus M. So, the sum over the final state uh, spins of the ampli of the final state spins absolute value squared is minus one over two p prime zero two q prime zero trace of minus i q prime slash minus m minus because it's a an antiparticle minus i p prime slash plus m gamma a and there is one of uh, these are the muons and so what I'm saying is that the final mu q prime is the full momentum of what? It's the anti-muon. The anti-muon is the mu plus. And um, because of this plus there. All right, similarly, the average over the initial spins of V bar QT gamma A U of PS absolute value squared is Wow, there's a typo. Can I use your pen? Just for a second. Thanks. So 
So this is minus a quarter sum over V bar, let me just abbreviate, V bar gamma A U, U bar gamma A V. This is then minus a quarter 1 over 2 Q0 2 P0 trace of minus I Q slash minus M gamma, well there's another typo, gamma A minus I P slash plus M gamma A. And uh, so P is the electron and um, what is it? Q is the positron. All right. Well, so when when we when you're doing this, your U bars. I mean, you're talking about S primes and T prime clear spins, and when you when you did this sum, you only had one. So I guess I'm not entirely one. So I mean, when you have your sum, the top here one, here S we're summing over S and T. And here we're summing over S prime and T prime. Okay. So these are the final spins of the muon, an anti-muon, initial spins of the electron and the positron. Now, I think I'll just, um, I'll basically leave it here and say, that this basically, well, all right, let me write down what the probability then is. The probability then is e to the fourth over four, two pi to the fourth. The product of these two traces, so let me just write them as product of two traces. And then there's the product of all of the energies times two. Two p zero, two p prime zero, 2q0, 2q prime 0. That's a feature that, the, that, that is very common in uh, the calculation of Feynman amplitudes. Then there's a delta fourth of, let us say, p plus q minus p prime minus q prime. And then there's a delta function of 0. And delta function of 0 is delta q of 0 vector delta of zero, but delta zero is the total time of the process divided by two pi. So you remember, you can write the delta function as delta of zero is just an integral of, let us say, dt over two pi. Well, the integral of dt is t, and then you have the two pi. So that's the probability. The rate is the probability divided by the time. So I write, this as p over t, and I just cancel this t. And that means I have 2 pi to the fifth here, and I've gotten rid of this 2 pi. So that's the rate. So we've gone then from amplitude to probability, and from probability to rate. Oh, I've erased it by mistake here. This is still delta q. All right, so this delta q is going to be v, the volume, divided by 2 pi cubed. 2 pi cubed is going to give us 2 pi to the 8. Mm -hmm. All right. So here we have a formula for the rate. The next thing is to um, use this delta function, divide by the, um, the incoming flux, and then multiply by the, uh, the phase space and then we get actually a cross section, and I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that till next semester. It's it's very simple, but it just happens that I haven't prepared that uh, latex. Um, and so I oh we're 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 getting late in time, aren't we? Um, when is this class supposed to end? I think it's six fifteen. More or less now is that yeah, right? It would be now. I think yeah, it's now. You, you, how are you doing with your football game? I have 15 minutes to get reference. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, maybe I should do the very beginning of um, Compton, or are you guys tired? Huh? Tired?
story time. Story time sounds good. Maybe do a very quick story time. Um, I told you about the Louisiana Purchase, right? Did, yeah. And I told you about Lincoln's nomination. Oh. And I, did I tell you about Wilson? No. All right, Wilson was another outlier. He was president of Princeton, and he was known within Princeton as a very rigid person. Uh, he basically saw things in terms of black and white, and he was black, you were in trouble. Um, um, I, well, I, I don't mean that he was, and I'm not, I don't mean to say that he was really a racist. He wasn't like Harry Bird, but um, um, he was rigid. That's what I meant by seeing things in terms of black and white. And uh, are you sure I didn't tell you about this? That all right. Well, his idea was the League of Nations, which was after the Treaty of Versailles, which was something like the UN. And Congress was basically for it, but there was a senator in Massachusetts named Lodge, Henry Cabot Lodge, and the saying in Massachusetts was that the, the Cabots spoke only to the Lodges, and the Lodges spoke only to God. Um, Anyway, they were Republicans. And um, Henry Cabot Lodge was a senator, and he hated Wilson, and he thought he didn't want Wilson to get credit for the League of Nations. So he introduced in the Senate reservations to the treaty. The reservations weren't going to make any difference, but he knew that Wilson would be too inflexible to accept the reservations, especially if Lodge introduced them. And so Wilson instead tried to convince the public, and he took a train across the country, and gave lots of speeches to tell people that, that um, they ought to support the League of Nations. But he wasn't very good at dealing with people. Um, and um, so he had almost no effect, and he got sick. He had high blood pressure, and people didn't know what to do about high blood pressure in those days. And he basically got really sick, and um, uh, the League of Nations went down, and that's one of the reasons why World War II started. It was A, there was no League of Nations, and B, the Treaty of Versailles was very unfair to Germany. And um, it wasn't so smart in the Mideast either. And in fact, uh, Lawrence of Arabia tried to do get a fair treaty for the Mideast, but um, he was, he had no, not, he didn't have sufficient standing, and I think Wilson didn't even listen to him. All right, so maybe, let me just sketch roughly what's going on with Compton scattering, um, just in order to, that you see what happens, namely that you introduce the, use these a and a dagger. And now the, the process is basically uh, this. You have a photon. Well, again, I drew it the wrong way. The intermediate line should always be horizontal. So basically, you have this structure. And one, pos one process is the photon is absorbed at x, emitted at y. But the other process is that the photon is emitted at x and absorbed at y. And now in both of these processes, you've got something like this. But um, instead of uh, mu, of course, we just have electrons if we're doing electron content scattering. And now you'd have an electron absorbed at x, an electron emitted at y, but now it's the electron that's virtual. If you do diagram one, you have the annihilating part of, x, of the photon at x 
and the creating part of the photon at Y. And these photons then, the photon field is a sum over, let us say, polarizations, integral dqk, and the normalization is 2k0, 2 pi q to the one half. And then it's a of k and lambda, epsilon of k and lambda, e to the i kx, plus a dagger of k and lambda, <coughs> epsilon star of k lambda, e to the minus i kx. And so you, you, these are, these are actually three vectors, and they're perpendicular to k. So you have k dot epsilon of k and lambda is zero, and this is the Coulomb gauge condition. And so you use this formula when you're dealing with an incoming or outgoing photons, and you have two possible uh, processes. And so you just basically substitute in here this. If you're doing the first diagram, then this term, this annihilation operator, gives you uh, an epsilon. And you would have uh, an e to the i kx. And it's created at y, so it would be minus y. And then here, you would have epsilon uh, slash, say, of k and lambda. And then over here, you have epsilon slash star of k prime lambda prime. And, um, and uh, let's, let me just get these things right. Um, this, you would still have psi bar of x, and you would have still psi of y, but you have this creating this final state electron. And so in the next, so this one would be, you would initially have PSK lambda and then you have p prime, s prime, k prime, lambda prime. And um, so this one would create the uh, lambda prime, so you, uh, uh, the p prime, s prime, so you have basically that. And um, this one would then be a uh, u bar of p prime, s prime. And now you see there's something new happening. Um, well, I'm, I'm back down to vacuum then. Right. So we're back down to, there's a vacuum state somewhere on the right here. And um, there's, there would be an e to the i px minus i p prime y. And now look what you have left. You have vacuum, time-ordered product, two Fermi fields, vacuum. And that would give you the Fermi propagator. And so I think we can stop now and just...